This week, in 2016, the Philadelphia 76ers fan base would hopefully be rejoiced for many, many years to come. Joel Embiid made his debut in the beginning of the season in 2016 after waiting two full years after being drafted third overall in the 2014 NBA Draft. In his very first game of action, Joel Embiid posted 20 points, seven rebounds, and two blocks, and a home loss to the Oklahoma City Thunder in just 22 minutes of action. Besides his two All-Star and two All-NBA appearances in just three years of action, Joel Embiid has become a fan favorite, not just in the city of Philadelphia, but throughout the entire league. You can catch Joel Embiid playing pickup basketball on the courts anywhere around the city with your average Joes. And we are certainly hoping to see many more historic years come from Joel Embiid during his career as a Sixer. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Two. You'll never have to be Oh, this you crazy mother... Hello and welcome to another edition of Sports Talk Philadelphia here on LaSalle TV. I'm your host Josh Abrams. Today we're going to be talking about a few headlines. We're going to talk some Eagles and Sixers uh, and let's get right into it. I have my panel with me today, Tyler Small, Jim Wister and Sam Long. Uh, we're going to get right into the headlines and the first big one that has broken for the second Thursday in a row now is that the Phillies finally get their, their man uh, in the clubhouse. Uh, they hired Joe Girardi uh, to replace Gabe Kapler after uh, after his firing last week, and I'm going to open it up to you guys and ask for your general reactions uh, to this development. Uh, I think I'll be a little bit forward than the rest of the desk, but I really don't like the move. Wow. I, oh, okay. I told you, I, I've said this before on the show that I'm a New York Yankees fan, and I, what I saw with his tenure, yeah, he went 9-10 and 7-10 over his span, and he won a World Series in 2009. But that, he can't get credit for that 2009 World Series. That, team, that roster was too deep. It was just too well overall for any manager to lose it, especially in the American League. I just think he really mismanages his bullpen. He ruined Andrew Miller, who now went on to the Cleveland Indians for a couple of years. He was the best reliever in baseball. He just doesn't know how to work a bullpen. And I think it's going to be too much for him to jump into the National League and switch over. That's a whole other animal to deal with for the Philadelphia Phillies. But hopefully it'll work out. But I wasn't the biggest fan of that deal. Any positive thoughts down there? <laughs> I like it. You know, we had to get rid of Kapler. I'm just happy some new blood's in there. It is a better move than Kapler, you're right, but I just don't think that it's the long-term fix, and I think he might get more credit than he's due before this. All right, so the other headline we're going to talk about, and not obviously not as big, but the Flyers are starting to fly her up again. Um, they, uh, they go on a losing streak in their road trip to Canada, um, which I guess, is, uh, I guess is not surprising, given that it was a, a Canada road trip, but... Um, you know, what's your guys' reaction to that? It, it, was, it was a pretty promising start to the season, but, you know, this three-game losing streak kind of has us in a funk. Yeah, I mean, they started the season strong 2-0, including that game in Prague, which is always difficult to travel. I know you'll talk about that later, but um, you, you see some of the things that they're doing well. They're getting the most shots up on goal per game in the NHL, so that's good to see a lot of sh shots going to the puck, making the goalie work. But at the same time, they have one of the lowest shot percentages because of it, because they just haven't been able to find the back of the net. So they just need to gel more as a unit, and they need to get some usage out of their um, younger guys. I mean, Forby is now up from the AHL, so hopefully he'll be able to spark something new into the team. But I don't think it's anything to worry about yet. Yeah, this losing streak was definitely kind of disappointing, especially with the way they started winning their first two games. But like you said, they started out over in Europe, and they came back home to Philly and then traveled all the way up to Canada. It's really hard to sustain momentum and be together as a team when you're traveling so much. Those are long flights, and it's just like long hours together, just like crammed in a little plane. So like a losing streak here, I don't think, defines their season as long as they turn it around now. Over 7,000 miles traveled. I mean, yeah, that's far. It's, it's, tough it's a to lot do. of travel. It's tough to do. So here's the thing about the Flyers. Every season, it seems like there's like a small little bit of hope, like a little bit just going on, and then they just ruin it, so I'm not surprised. Yeah, we're hoping the sample size uh, stays as small as it is uh, right now. Um, but that's going to do it for our headlines, and we're going to get right into Eagles talk. And, yeah, man, they, they, really, they really disappointed all of us this weekend. Um, you know, w when we get into our picks, uh, it'll, be, it'll be easier for me to, to explain this. But, guys, I am not 
I'm done being a homer. I'm done getting false hope anymore. This was the biggest game of the season by far. And I know we're only seven weeks, eight weeks in now. Um, but this was just an absolute disgrace. And almost as almost with the Phillies this past season, I'm embarrassed. I'm extremely embarrassed to be an Eagles fan after that game. Um, just horrible play all around. You know, we, we get the ball to start the game, which is what I've been a proponent of all season, getting the ball and punching them in the mouth early. But we got punched in the mouth. The ball got punched out. I mean, everything went wrong for the, for the Eagles. Yeah, I mean, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit. I mean, you're going to play the Cowboys again, obviously, and this was a home game for the Cowboys. So in essence, and you look at the spreads and everything, it wasn't a game they were supposed to win. But you're right. I mean, that takes over the division. It's still early. They're only a game back. So the NFC East, thankfully, because all four of the teams are playing so poorly, it's not completely out of reach, obviously, yet. But I mean, their defense has just been a huge Achilles heel for the team letting Dak Prescott look like a quarterback like that, 239 yards, and then Ezekiel Elliott over 100 rushing yards and a touchdown. You have such an amazing offense, but if you're letting them run it down your throat the entire game, just losing clock, you can't show the offense. The offense is never going to have the ball, especially if they're turning it over. So it's just the defense is really under a spotlight right now. I'm very disappointed that Carson Wentz got outplayed by Dak Prescott. I personally do not think Dak Prescott is a good quarterback. They paid him a lot of money. He's not a top-tier quarterback. Carson Wentz got thoroughly outplayed by him in that game. It would definitely help him if the Eagles could like establish the run earlier. They need to get the ball, give it to Jordan Howard, let him pound out four or five yards on first down. So then we get ahead of the chains, and then we have chances to take a uh, deep shot or hit Ertz over the middle or something. Like There just needs to be more balance on the offense, I believe. Yeah, no, that game just hurt to watch. I don't know how else to put it. How, Turning, long, did, how long did you last uh, watching it? Uh, up until the third. Okay. You ever see a grown man cry before? That's how that was for me. So I turned it on, back-to-back -back turnovers with the Cowboys scoring right off the start. I was just at a loss for words. I didn't know what to say. I didn't say nice things, but <laughs> no, it not was at terrible. All. Not at all. I mean, that right there, that point you made, is, is really just the kind of the, the deciding factor. I know there's a lot more time in football, but, you know, the first two possessions, you give them a short field because of what you did on your offensive possession. It's just very bothersome to watch, and, I mean, there's so many things you can point to uh, negatively, but I will say a, a, a positive outlook for this team right now is their first round draft pick from this past year, rookie offensive tackle Andre Dillard. He made his first start this weekend because Jason Peters was obviously out and sidelined. Uh, he didn't give up any sacks. Um, what do you think gives to that fact? Well, I mean, so yeah, he looked good on paper, but 13 out of the 18 offensive snaps he played ended up being run. So it didn't seem like they really trusted him for any kind of pass protection. It just seems like they were trying to ease him in. So maybe that game wasn't as good as everyone thinks it was. Interesting. Fair point. Especially because the running back numbers weren't great from this game. So no. if he was in for so many of those plays, he obviously didn't give up a lot of gaps in the A block. So we'll see. Um, I honestly think he played pretty well given the circumstances. It's really hard as a rookie to make it as an offensive tackle. It's a very big transition from the college game to the pros. And considering the matchup that he had with DeMarcus Lawrence on one end, Robert Quinn on the other, I think he held up really well. Yeah, that's a good point. I, uh, I never even realized how good – I knew we all knew about DeMarcus Lawrence, but the fact that Robert Quinn's on that, on that line now, it does make it a, a lot more scary. Um, you know, another problem, and it goes hand in hand because it happens almost every game, but uh, not only do the Eagles not have a, a number one wide receiver right now, I know Alshon Jeffrey is usually that guy, but – he has not performed up to those standards at all this season. And then the defense, on the other hand, has given up 100-yard games to receivers left and right. I mean, Julio and Amari Cooper are just examples. I mean, looking at the offensive struggles, we've only had two 100-yard receiving games from our guys, and one of them's probably not even going to play the rest of the season for all we know. So, you know, what do you, what's your guys' take on that? I mean, it's just that's probably the more outstanding fact to me. Yeah, I, I would kind of say that it is an offensive struggle like that. I mean, and the only game that you saw that was in this Green Bay game because they showed the running game. I, they had Jordan Howard at his best, and it was en route to a huge win on the road. But if you give Carson Wentz as an only a passer and he has no running game besides him, you're not going to have to pack the box. You're gonna, not going to have to let Andre Dillard have to block him away from a sack because he could have a clean pocket, but he's going to have no one to throw to, and he'll have nothing to do because they'll be sitting back in that zone not fearing the running game at all. So that's, just where, that's what it comes down to. You need to run the ball more. Let, let me ask this. So 
the cornerback situation, really just any position on the, on the team situation is pretty bad, but the cornerback specifically. Um, we, we saw what happened with Marcus Peters and Jalen Ramsey, how they were interrelated in the trades that they were in. Do you think even getting one of the better uh, corners out there, or maybe even just one of the better res, uh, res, uh, players at their respective positions, is that even going to do much for us right now? I think it could, depending on the player we get. Obviously, last year you've seen when the Cowboys made that trade for Amari Cooper, that completely transformed their offense. And they went from a team that were probably not going to make the playoffs to making the playoffs, and I'm pretty sure they won the division and had they a home did, game yeah. last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so depending on the type of player you pick up, it can really change your season. And the Eagles should have went out there and made more aggressive offers for Jalen Ramsey or maybe even Marcus Peters if they couldn't have gotten Ramsey because clearly the Rams wanted to move on from him. They just need anyone to spark something. Here's a quick stat from all like the passing yards to this date. Yeah. 239 yards to Dak, um, Kirk Cousins 333, Luke Falk was the only one below 200, he had 120 bets because he's a third string, yeah. 422 to Rodgers, 201 to Stafford, 320 to Ryan, and 380 to Case Keenum. Uh, anybody could come in and do a better job than that. And then when you cannot protect from the pass from these middle tier quarterbacks, the only one being kind of good is Rodgers and maybe Ryan. If you can't stop the pass, how are you going to stop the run? And then Ezekiel Elliott has a breakout game because you can't pack the box. You have only four rushing. So right. it's tough. So, yeah, we offered up a trade for Patrick Peterson. We offered Nelson Aguilar in a first-round pick. Yeah. And, I mean, he's the next best thing available, so I think we should go for him. We might have to offer more. Right. He's not even available, according yeah. to the team, the owner right. of the Cardinals. Well, we're going to go to our, stout, our, our uh, scouting report now. Uh, we play the Bills this weekend, who are 5-1. and one. They look like uh, if they were in the NFC, if they were in the NFC, they would be arguably the best team with the 49ers. Uh, the first player that we're looking at here is Josh Allen. Now, his stats are, very, are kind of misleading because he does have one of the worst QBRs in the league, but he is also one of the better rushing quarterbacks that this league has to offer. Are you guys concerned about this kind of uh, quarterback? Because I don't think we've really faced anybody like him so far. No, he's a different breed because you, you see of that crop of quarterbacks that came in the draft a couple years ago, Lamar Jackson gets all the hype for being um, a versatile quarterback. You now you see Kyler Murray the next year, but he's a little bit different because he's so athletic and so mobile, but yet he's strong as well. He doesn't slide out of play, and nobody's worried about his injury risk because he's such a big guy. So he could really light up with some of the best of them. He's coming off a rough week against the Dolphins, which they barely got it out, but I think he's going to have a big game against his Eagles secondary. I personally don't think the Eagles should have to worry about him too much. He's not a good quarterback. They need to stack the box and make him throw in order to beat them. They have a lot bigger concerns, obviously, like with the Bills' defense coming, and they're one of the better defenses in the league. Like I said, if they can force Josh Allen to stand in the pocket and make throws to beat them, I don't think they'll have a problem with him. Yeah, well, I mean, he's no Tyrod Taylor, but I'm still concerned about him. I mean, I could probably go in and throw for 300 yards against the Eagles right now. Yeah, probably. All right, um, let's go to our picks real quick. And, uh, yeah, just to give you guys a little spoiler alert, we are not feeling good this week at all. Uh, I have them – I have the Bills squeaking out – a 28-24 win at home, and, you know, again, Allen's uh, QBR certainly doesn't have anything to show, but, again, his, uh, his legs are going to really keep Buffalo a, a scary threat on offense, in my opinion. Tyler, your pick. Yeah, I had it 24-13, um, Bills. I think that Allen will do probably just enough to win the game and get them enough of points on offense, but I just think the defense is one of the best. It's second best, unfortunately, in the, in the conference because of how good New England's been, but, right. I mean... Phillips is going to be a menace. He's been great against the run and attacking the, um, attacking the quarterback, so it's going to be a tough game for the Eagles offense. All right, real quick, you guys go over your picks. All right, I have the Bills winning 17-13. It's going to be a very low-scoring game. Neither offense is that good. The Bills' defense is great. I think the Bills are going to win. Jordan Poyer is going to come up with at least one interception against the Eagles. Okay, and Sam? I took the Bills winning 35-17 with Cole Beasley as the MVP because I can't think of another receiver on that team. <laughs> That's fair, and he's actually a pretty good receiver, and you, yeah. actually, and you have the highest uh, spread, too, so you're really not feeling good this yeah, week, no. which is fair. Uh, but we're going to go to a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to talk some Sixers, so don't go anywhere. Oh, my God, I swear, these sports show hosts just get dumber and dumber as time goes on. Like, I can't believe people are actually paid money, real money, more than what I make at my job to say this stupid stuff. Like, I can't believe this crap. Oh, my God. I'm just gonna, I'm about to lose it. I'm about to lose it. Like, this is just, how can they even, like, hey, what you doing? This stupid sports show. These, show. these people have no idea how the game of basketball is played. Not at all. Hey, you're not you when you don't watch the South TV. Here, let me show you. Have much more left, but the only reason why. For everyone else, it's a one year left, but. 
Feel better now? Better. You're not you when you're not watching LaSalle TV. To stay up to date, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The sun of fire and beauty. Destruction and life. Something so magnificent you can't even look at it. My sun of fire and passion. Life until death. Something so magnificent you can't look away. Maybe because we don't look at the sun. We are afraid that we might not be able to let go of the beauty that just might end up destroying us. TV. Sam Long is stepping out. Tyler and Jim are going to stick with me as we talk Sixers. And guys, that was a that was a really good um, really good opening win yesterday. Um, you know, there were obviously some struggles here and there, but I think the fact that we were able to gut out a home win against a team that we haven't really had a lot of success against in recent years, to be able to gut out a win at home the way that they did has to be very encouraging. Oh, sure. I mean, you get all the pre the preseason offseason hype. I saw. Everyone from the school pretty much reposting all the hype videos, and it's exciting to see them go in and win it at home in front of a packed stadium like it was. Um, I thought the biggest takeaway to take from this game was how evenly spread the offense was from the starting five. Harris finished with 15, um, Al finished with 16, and Bede 15, Simmons 24, and Richardson 17. That's not something you saw last year, and that was maybe their biggest problem. You would have, last year, you'd have Jimmy Butler drop 30, and then Redick would have five. You only get like two shots off. It would just would not get the ball spread around enough. But I think this is a very great sign to see that they're meshing so well the game, first game. Oh yeah, it was a great game to watch. Personally, I'm a little disappointed Ben Simmons didn't even attempt a three. I would have loved to have seen him start off the game just shooting one just for the fun of it. But honestly, he played amazing. I think he has a chance to actually be in the running to win MVP this year because I believe the e uh, Sixers are going to be the best team in the East. So just based on like our standings, he's going to average close to a triple double this year. He should be at least in the conversation for MVP. Come that time. I, I agree yeah, with that. And, you know, if, you know, you're talking about the big takeaways. I think the biggest thing that I took away from this game was that this team is so is it is it is so apparent, so obvious. You can see from the moment you start watching them how their defense, their defensive presence on the floor skyrocketed from last year. I mean, the biggest problem that we had in the past couple of years was oh, who's going to come in and back up and bead? Who's going to come mm -hmm. in off the bench? Uh, you know, J.J. Reddick's in the starting lineup, so what defense is, is he going to play? Everyone in the starting lineup is at least six foot six or taller, and it's not even the height that, that makes their defense so good. It's just the way they play on defense. I mean, Brett Brown said it himself that he was going to implement a smash-mouth offense and a bully defense. Um, you know, I don't know if it was necessarily a, a bully defense on display last night, but the fact that we held the Celtics to the numbers that they put up it's just a very good, very encour encouraging sign for our defensive presence. And the one thing you see that with is with the, the big accusation, um, acquisition excuse me, that we got this offseason, Al Horford. He was coming here to be that steady four. He's going to be a five if we have to when Embiid's getting some rest. And he is just a menace on defense. He is a sol just a solid, can jump out of the gym. He's been great. And, you saw, I mean, you saw the stats from some of the bench players. And we'll get to the bench in a minute, I'm sure. But... I think that that is huge to see Al Horford stepping up like that. And the other thing is Kemba Walker being a short guard. That's the only thing that would be able to beat us is somebody undersized getting right. through because you say how big we are. But holding him to 12 points is pretty big in this opener. Yeah, as you said, our defense played amazing. We have such a huge team. Teams are going to have a hard time getting shots up, getting passes through the lane, which is so much length out on the court. But I think Josh Richardson was a very underrated pickup. Everyone likes to talk about getting Al Horford from the Celtics. But Josh Richardson's probably our best perimeter defender on the team. Yeah. He's going to be a dog out there all year, hounding the best ball handlers on the other team. And he's really going to be like our key to success most games, I believe. And the key is that they could both drop 20 on a given night, too. So it's not, they're mm -hmm. just not a one-way player. They can play both ends of the court, which is huge. And not a lot of Sixers players have been able to say that so far. 
Oh, yeah, for sure. I think another encouraging sign was uh, Matisse Thibel. I mean, even though he only scored three points, but that one, the one three he hit in the game was vir- I virtually put it away. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's getting – it seems like from that small sample size last night that he's going to be getting uh, very significant, consistent minutes, maybe 20, 25 a game. But he's going to be playing d- deep into the games down the stretch. And the defense that he was playing against those guys, Boston's no slouch of a team even though they lost – uh, Kyrie Irving. I mean, they they still have Gordon Hayward. They still have their young guys, very young, talented rookies. That's a very talented Boston team that Thibel showed out against, especially on defense. Yeah, he certainly did. And you're right. I mean, now I think that they're going to be better without Kyrie just because of all the locker room talk. And now that Gordon Hayward can actually be himself, which is great to see now that yeah. he's healthy. But you're right. I mean, shutting them down should not be slept on at all. I mean, It's going to be huge, and the only reason that anyone in this NBA media would think that the Sixers aren't the best in the East is because of their lack of depth off the bench. But if you see some a very fitting performance from that, maybe the numbers aren't there to back it. But people like him or Scott or O'Quinn, it's going to be huge being those guys to come off the bench and to give the probably one of the best starting fives in all of basketball a rest. To your point on Matisse Thibault, he is an amazing defender. Coming out of college, there were a lot of questions because at Washington, he played in like a zone defense, Mm -hmm. and they thought that. Um, a lot of his steals are just a product of being able to sit back and play his own rather than stick your man. But he was amazing last night. He was hounding the ball carriers or ball handlers. He was a little aggressive. He kind of like went for steals a little too often. But that's good to see out of rookie is being aggressive, not afraid to make those plays. Mm-hmm. I feel like he could be our version of uh, Andre Roberson, but with a lot better jump shot. Sure. And I'm glad you brought up the point about being a little too aggressive because I think something you wanted to discuss was the foul troubles, not just for the for the Sixers, but for both teams. And I think that was a big reason why Probably one, why the game took longer than it did. And yeah. two, uh, the fact that the Sixers were just able to run away in the second half. I think foul trouble between both teams was uh, pretty much on display, but the Celtics just so happened to struggle with it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah both teams got into foul trouble early. It's just like it was the first game of the season. It's kind of to be expected. It wasn't the most um, put-together brand of basketball. It was pretty sloppy. But the Sixers got to the line 36 times, and the Celtics got there 34 times. That's a lot of free throws for both yeah. teams to be shooting. We're just lucky that we were able to convert our free throws a lot better than Celtics, where they missed just about half of the attempts they took. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's huge, and that's how you win steal road games. So being able to – and that's a, an attribution to how crowded it was there, how loud it was in that stadium. So it's definitely huge that that's a difference maker that Wells Fargo offers. All right, now I'll, before we move on to Fast Five, I, I want to leave you guys with this. Um, so obviously we know, we know basketball today as a 3-and-D kind of game. Um, not, we know not every player is going to be like that or play like that, but uh, the three-point shot and um, I think really just the three-point shot in general is starting to take over the game. Um, not saying that the Sixers team isn't able to shoot the ball, because they are, but do you think their defense is going to be able to make up for what could potentially be lack of shooting down the, down the line? It's going to have to. I mean, the perimeter defense is going to be huge because every team that you're playing is going to be live or die on the three, basically. That's been the formula that the Warriors have set to win championships, so everyone's trying to mimic it. The number one competition in the East is the Milwaukee Bucks, I'd say, and they're the same way. Giannis can penetrate on anyone and then kick it out to four key shooters. So it's going to be huge to see the 76ers team be able to defend both on the inside with Joel Embiid and Al Horford and others and then be able to get out for the outside for those shots as well because – that's going to be their key in the playoffs. Yeah, I believe our defense is going to make up for the lack of shooting in most games. However, there are going to be certain games where we really need to score. And I think that the uh, general manager, the front office, is going to have to go make some trades or something just to bring in some shooting. Mm-hmm. I personally would love to see them sign Jamal Crawford. He's an instant bucket off the bench every yeah. single night. He can easily drop 12 to 20 points in, like, a second. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. There's definitely need, they definitely need to make some moves. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, again, real quick, the upcoming schedule, we got Detroit – Atlanta, and then we come back home for Minnesota. Those should be three easy, winnable games, right? For sure. Yeah, they should be. You never know just because I think Carl Anthony Towns is one of the better big men Mm -hmm. in the league, so he could pose a little bit of a trouble to us, but I feel like we should be able to handle all three of those teams. And at the same time, the Pistons are kind of more of like a style like ours. We have to go through Blake Griffin and Andre Drummond, so we'll have to see what they can do on the road. All right, well, that's going to do it for Sixers Talk. We're going to get right into Fast Five, and uh, Tyler, we're going to come to you first. Uh, the World Series is at a 2-0 lead for the Nationals now. General thoughts? Doesn't sound, my prediction of the Nationals winning doesn't sound as good now because it's already 2-0 and they're going back to Washington. But I just thought it was way too difficult for, A, the Houston Astros to win under this controversy, which we're not going to get into here, obviously. Right. Yeah. But, and also, it just 
it just feels different. It feels like a team of destiny. Mr. National Ryan Zimmerman in his first postseason at bat as he was the first draft pick by the team when they became the Nationals. Mm. Home run and then Juan Soto has been unreal and the pitching staff just can't be beat. Jim, who's going to rack up more receiving yards on Sunday? It's going to be tough to get some receiving yards, <laughs> but who on the Eagles do you think is going to end up leading the team? Um, I'm going to go with Zach Ertz. Um, the Bills defense is amazing. It's going to be really hard to get anything going, but he's the most consistent target uh, Wentz has. That's fair. Uh, Tyler, the Flyers, even though they have struggled and, like I said earlier, have been flyering it up, um, there's still some bright spots. What's the biggest bright spot to you? Easily so far has been Travis Konechny. He's played amazing seven games. He has four goals and six assists, six assists a total in ten points. Some of his goals have been unbelievable. The one in, um, against Chicago in Prague, which is unreal, the backhand over the left uh, shoulder of the goalie. So he's been a shining star, but for an offense that really hasn't been able to been hasn't been able to finish in front of the goal, so I think connecty has been the star. Uh, Jim, so the college football playoff is still a little bit ways away, but we are halfway through. Who do you think is going to be ended up making the cut? So I have LSU coming in at number one, Oklahoma coming in at number two, Clemson number three, and Alabama four. I think LSU and Bama are going to, they're obviously going to play later in the year. I think LSU wins that game because Jer Jer uh, Joe Burrow is the best quarterback in the nation right now. He's been playing yeah. lights out every single week. And I honestly have LSU as my favorite right now to win the national title. All right, Tyler, last but not least, uh, there is a quarterback controversy going on in New England. Um, that's pretty big, especially for the Patriots fans. Any thoughts on that? I think the media is blowing it a little bit out of proportions. I mean, you see some of the jokes, Sanu coming in with a 158.3 QBR as opposed to Tom Brady's um, career, 97.3. So, Mohamed Sanu. Mohamed Sanu, the <laughs> wide receiver, yep. But, I mean, you saw it on Thursday Night Football the other day. Tom Brady's apparently putting his house up for sale, so is his trainer. He wants to make sure that his free agency clause is available at the end of the season. Oh my God, he's 42 years old. I think it's just all blown out of proportions. If he's going to go somewhere else, he's obviously not going to be anything because he's nothing without Bill Belichick. He wouldn't have half of his Super Bowls. All right, well, that's going to do it for this week's edition of Sports Talk Philadelphia. You can catch us on social media on Twitter at Sports Talk LTV. Catch us on Facebook at facebook.com slash LaSalle TV. And also check us out on YouTube, where you can not only check out our episodes, but all the other shows on LaSalle TV. Find us there. We hope you enjoy your weekend. We're going to hope, really hope, for an Eagles <laughs> win. No, it's false hope, though. Uh, we hope you enjoy your weekend, and we'll see you next Thursday. All right.